Good morning, everyone. Today is 12 May, the year 2004. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in those conflicts. Today, I'm here at the museum along with special guest Harriet Steffes, and today we have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Lieutenant Melvin Steffes. Lieutenant Steffes was a B-17 bombardier flying out of England during World War II, was shot down over Germany in 1944 and was captured and kept prisoner in Stalag Luft I for nine months. So we're going to talk to him about that and a lot of other things. Nice to have you here, Mel. Thank you. Now, can you repeat your name and, uh, and spell your full name for us, please? Melvin Steffes, M-E-L-V-I-N-S-T-E-F-F-E-S. And when and where were you born? I was born in a little town in Nebraska, Humphrey, Nebraska. It's a town of about 800 people. And then my dad bought a ranch. Humphrey, Nebraska is in the green country where they grew corn and things like that. And he bought a ranch in the sand hills. And uh, we lived on that for quite a while. And what year was that and uh, the date you were born? I was born in 1918, in January 18th, 1918. So I'm not 46 years old now. <laughs> 86. <laughs> and uh, um, your, what was your dad's name? Nicholas Steffes, Nicholas J. Steffes, uh, and uh, he and a brother is uh, Jake Steffes, who was a ran a grocery store in Humphrey, Nebraska. Bought this ranch together, and they, they had about five thousand head of cattle. And How many two, acres on the ranch? Yeah, uh, we figured it out. Well, what did we figure out? It, well, it was about uh, seven and a half, seven to eight miles long and about four miles oh, wide. Pretty good size. Uh. <laughs> it was, yeah. It's a good size. Yeah. yeah. Um, and where, um, what part of Nebraska was, or how cl what were some of the larger towns? Or close the, by? Larger, the larger town where we were at was population of 60, Bartlett, Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> but what part of the state was it? Uh, kind of in the middle of the state. Uh, yeah, more northwest. Okay. Okay. Ellington, Nebraska, or O'Neill, or something like that. And how did, um, how long had your family lived in, uh, did your grandfather live there, or who, how did, where did your ancestors come from originally? My ancestors came, uh, my mother's uh, came from Germany, and my grandmother and you know, her brothers. And my father's, I don't know, where did he come from? I can't remember. Yeah. They also came from Germany. Like the Germany. Well, in Germany, it was, yeah. it was over there, too. <laughs> okay. And your mother, what was her name and her maiden name? Well, my mother was uh, died about two months after I was born. Did she end the flu epidemic of 1918? Is no. That she, no? Uh, my grandfather died of that. She kind of oh. did nothing to do with my birth or anything like that. She was uh, Elizabeth Steffes. Uh -huh. And then about a year and a half later, my dad married her sister. Oh, really? <laughs> and what was so, her first name? Teresa Steffes. And what was their maiden name before they got married? Bering. B-E-R-I-N-G. Okay. Um, so you... How old were you when you, uh, were you born on the farm? I mean, did I you? I was born in Humphrey, Nebraska, and uh, they bought the ranch around the time I was born. Okay. And uh, in my teens, I, I worked on the ranch. <laughs> okay. I learned how to ride horses, and I had a, I rode all day long, chicken fences and count cattle. And what kind of cattle did you have? Herford cattle. And, uh, and did you guys uh, slaughter them yourself or take them to the to the slaughterhouses or what? 
so sold them to, to, uh, to Omaha, Nebraska, uh, into the cattle farm. And so would you truck them to like the railroad station to get them there? Or no, how? we drove them. You drove them all the way? <laughs> <laughs> you could go down a road back in those days. We didn't have cars like you got now. So yeah. our, our uh, really the main uh, product was selling horses before tractor days. Horses were the prime. Like plow horses and? Plow horses and anything that the farmer needed in a, in a station. So, so how many horses would you normally have at one about time? 250. Really? Yeah, the horses. Did you have riding horses to ride as oh, well? Oh yes, oh yes. Uh, what, what kind? Quarter horses or what, what would you have? Then? Oh, I, I don't recall. I had a I had a spotted pony that I my. <laughs> um, did you have uh, how how close were your nearest neighbors and things? I mean, did you have friends that you kids that you played with when you? No, were? no. Uh, ranches were quite far apart. Uh, I imagine the closest ranch to us was about five miles. And, uh, Did you have any brothers and sisters? Uh, yes, I had a brother and a sister. Unfortunately, a brother who was the oldest one would be about, probably about nine or ten years older than me. Uh, he liked to overdo himself as far as getting around. And, and it, we usually had about three months of haying time. We had a big hang group, and uh, he would like to entice the, the men to let them use his the rifles. So my dad had given strict orders, and no one was to ever allow, allow him to use their equipment or anything. But he taught when my dad wasn't there. He talked to one of the rake drivers into letting me in, use the rig. Unfortunately, he ran into a bubble he's missed and had a runaway. Threw him way up in the air. He was in jail. Oh, okay. These rakes were huge. They were three horses through the, the rakes. So he would have yeah. been how old at that time? Probably. He was nine years old. Oh, he was, so you never even knew him? No. Yet. You just knew what happened? And what was his name? Edwin Steffes. And your sister, what, what was her name? Corolla Steffes. Was she younger or older than you? She was older. She was about four years older than me. And uh, she finally came out to California. Now, um... And there were more from the second marriage. Oh, okay. So you had some stepbrothers and sisters yeah, too? Yeah, and we had three. Then, uh, my stepmother, Teresa Steppes, and, yeah. and we had a, a brother and two sisters. And what were their names? Jean Steppes was the brother, and uh, Mary Elizabeth and Catherine Ann. Are they still alive? Uh, are they still Mary living? Mary Elizabeth is. Yes, she is. Yeah. And where does she live? In the Seattle. Um, uh, you grew up kind of during the Depression, I think. Uh, what, what was that like for you? Did you notice it much about very, that? I graduated from high school right in the midst of it all, like in uh, 30, 31. Yeah. And it was rough. You couldn't get a job. You, you know, there weren't any. Did it impact your the ranch as far as selling the cattle and things all that much? Well, it impacted it to this extent. Uh, as the tractors came in, we they didn't need our horses anymore. Yeah. So yes, we lost the ranch by my oh. um, you, you, What what grammar school did you go to? In the, this this was a big contention between my mother and my dad. She wouldn't allow us kids to go in one of these little one horse one room. Uh, schoolhouses where the teacher taught them everything from first to eighth grade. Right. So 
Pumford, Nebraska was about 90 miles from Bartlett, Nebraska. And uh, in school years, for a while, we lived with my grandmother and her brother in Humphrey and went to school with Crowell and I. Uh, and finally, they bought a house in Humphrey. <laughs> and uh, my dad would have to do his batching by himself in the ranch <laughs> during the school year. And then in the summer, then we all moved out to the ranch. So you went to high school there in uh, Humphrey also? Yes. So. His mother wanted him to have a Catholic education. Oh, okay. So you went to a, a Catholic school? Yes. Oh, what was the name of that? St. Francis High. Oh, okay. And uh, do you remember what, uh, what you had nuns and priests there? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Father Ben was the, the priest. The nuns, I don't, I can't remember their names. Yeah. Do you, oh, remember, yeah. you remember what order they were? Uh, San Franciscans. Franciscans. Uh, yeah, I had Franciscan nuns in grade school. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, did you play sports in high school? No. I uh, was injured about two years old. I had what they call osteomyelitis, uh, which is TB of the bone, and affected my right hand, my left foot. Uh -huh. and, uh, mother wouldn't allow any <laughs> chasing around. <laughs> did uh, what subjects did you like in school the best? Oh. I guess history was the best thing. In fact, it was a very worrisome thing many nights. I would think, well, these things are going to happen to us. Oh, yeah. So you realize, you knew that history repeats, it tends to repeat itself. Right. <laughs> um, did you, um, okay, you graduated in 1932, did you say, from yes. high school? So then what did you do? Did you go ahead? Well, I had an aunt. My sister were out in Baltimore, Maryland, and I, I wanted to be, I wanted to, I was a carpenter, I wanted to make cabinets and things like that. Well, she happened an old cabinet maker back in Baltimore and figured out she could get me a job. So we went back to Baltimore, Maryland, and by the time we got there, the cabinet worker had retired. <laughs> so that was out. So I went to work as a grease monkey in the Chevrolet dealership oh. for a while. Uh -huh. And the uh, Christmas party come up and they had, yeah, I couldn't figure what a Christmas party was. But they had tubs of oysters and clams and seafood. And I, what the heck, I, I'm the beef man. <laughs> <laughs> So I didn't participate in that. I soon left Chevrolet and went to work for Goodyear. <laughs> it was unusual. I walked the streets from the morning to night. You'd write down the license number of the car that had the bad tires. You had to name the tires. And uh, for every card you turned in, you got a nickel. <laughs> So I had to turn in many of them to make a living. And so that uh, that went on for about a year, and then I finally went back to Nebraska and uh, went to Creighton University. Omaha. In Omaha, Nebraska. What was your major? Major in accounting. Now, had, had you guys lost the ranch by this time? Yes. Oh. So yeah. what did your father do after? Uh, well, what? His brother, of course, had the, the grocery, grocery store, store, so he worked there. And, and uh, then the, his brother, Jake uh, Steffes, died, and uh, he became the runner of the grocery store. And then Mother joined him working. So you're at uh, Creighton. So what year did you start at Creighton then? Uh, let's see, I graduated in 36, so. 32. Okay. No, you yeah. graduated from Creighton in 1941. 41 from Creighton. Yeah, 42. 32. Oh, okay. All right. Um, 
And what was your major again? E accounting. Econ accounting, yeah. And uh, when I graduated, well, I had to work in school the first couple of years. I worked in the lawns and things like that. They called it an NYA program. And then I got the job with professors correcting papers and things like that. And uh, the last two years, I worked as night school secretary. I sold books to the night school people who collected their <laughs> tuition. So I got to know the, the dean of the county pretty well. When I graduated, uh, I was able to, I got a job with the Federal Land Bank. With, with a Federal Land Bank. Federal Land, oh, a bank, uh -huh. Federal Land Bank. Yeah. <coughs> federal and Government. I, uh -oh. oh, I hated it. <laughs> and so the dean called me one night and said, I want to know whether I'd like to work for Chevrolet. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow. So I went down to Kansas City, to, and my sister and uh, her husband were living down there. So I went down there for a weekend. I got an appointment with the controller of Chevrolet Accounting Department, which was attached to the uh, manufacturing, Chevrolet manufacturing there. Oh, okay. It wasn't like a dealership. It was. No, it was, uh, it was Chevrolet Motor Division, oh. General Motors. Were they? Building the cars. Yes. Uh -huh. And so it, it was a much pleasant job. <laughs> so that's where I was working when the world would go. Yeah. Do you, do you remember what you were doing on December 7th? Not particularly. I was still with Chevrolet. And uh, I don't, I can't really imagine, I, I can't think what, yeah. what I was doing or anything. No. But what? Of course, you had interested in history and all, so did you see this coming, that, that uh, we were probably going to tangle with the Japanese pretty oh, soon? Oh, yes. I, I have stayed up many nights worrying about that, and what, what, what was I going to do? <laughs> and what did you do? Well, when the war broke out, of course, I immediately, I immediately made the decision that I didn't want to join the Army. I didn't want to have to be a dole. I had two uncles that were in World War One, and I had listened to their tales many times, and that wasn't my thing. So, of course, I decided I was going to join the Air Corps, and you couldn't get in the Air Corps. It was closed. And the draft was breathing by my neck. <laughs> And I uh, tried the Army and the, or the Marines and the Navy, but due to my hand, they, they, they wouldn't take me. So I joined the R RCAF. Oh, you did? In Kansas City, Missouri. But they wouldn't give me, the government, uh, Kansas City wouldn't give me a deferment. Right? So it looked like I was going to have to go in the Army. About that time, Eleanor Roosevelt wrote a big article in the paper what what a terrific job our American boys were doing the RAF and the RCA. I cut that out and took it down just like that. I had a deferral. So I was to go in the in the RCAF in May of that year. In about April the three the countries, England, RCAF and uh, America decided uh, they were going to train each other. <laughs> so here I am out in the opening. <laughs> the the draft's breathing down my throat real bad. And in July, the Army Air Corps opened up, and I joined the Air Corps. And a real amusing story a good friend of mine in Chevrolet that, was, that I worked with kept trying to tell me to get in the V7 program. He says, they're so filled up with enlistments. He says, I don't know when I'll have to go to that. A V7, was that were you, uh, like an ROTC thing in college or something? No, it was a regular, uh, uh, regular Navy program. Oh, okay. And 
it was real amazing in, in the Easter of that year. I took a week's vacation, went home to Nebraska for a week. When I came back, he was gone. <laughs> and this was Navy B7. Navy B7. So, so much for <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, Jimmy. I, I finally got in the Air Corps in uh, July. And where did you go? Where, the Air, where? Well, the Air Corps. They didn't call me up until January for January sometime in the, the, the next year. Probably 43. 43. Yeah. And so finally I got got called in. And so that's how much longer I did. So you were working for Chevrolet all that time? Oh, yes. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, I went to Kelly Field and San Antonio and uh, took my basic training there. From there, went to uh, uh, Plant Bluff, Arkansas, for primary training, and, uh, which was very enjoyable. Did, I, you, did you did you fly solo oh, yeah, there? Did yeah, I solo there. And, uh, Do you remember what what plane you solo then? Uh, you know, what was it? Uh, oh boy, it was a little sing single wing. Uh, BT-13. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it was pleasant. Yeah. There were five of us to an instructor. There were civilian instructors. Did flying come easy to you? Oh, very easy, yeah. So then from there I went to Coffeyville, Kansas for my basic training. And uh, now it was, uh, it's a little different. Bigger plane. Is, uh, there were twenty of us to an instructor, <laughs> and uh, so about a halfway through, I washed out. An average of three out of the twenty made it. So. Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, I figured that was my saddest day. I didn't know it was Saturday, <laughs> but anyway, you had to go through a. Court martial and everything else to, to take it out of flying school, and then I went. The, the, uh, I was fortunate; most of them got transferred right to the army. I went to. I got transferred to the Bombardier Navigating School in, uh, in Childress, Texas, and it, probably. <clears throat> due to the, probably due to the fact that I'd had my college education and everything that I got that. Because uh, when war broke out, I was 24 years old. So it, uh, most of them were in their 20s right. or younger. even under. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, did, I finally made second lieutenant there in the so what were some of the things uh, that you learned there they, they taught you in the Bombardier uh, Navigator? So well, of course, the big thing is we, we learned how to, how to use the Norton bomb site. And it was really, they had big trainers, probably about as high as this room. And you'd get on them and you'd guide the trainer right into the targets. Oh, uh-huh. <laughs> And then, of course, they had little, uh, they had small uh, bomber planes, too. We dropped sandbags. <laughs> I heard they said, um, I believe, that the Norton bombsite was actually probably the first computerized equipment that was ever right. built. And early on, the bombsite, the bombardier was told that that had to be destroyed the first thing. Right. By the time that... I became a flyer. It was what Colin thinks. Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I went from uh, Bombardier Navigator School, and we had to go to gunnery school. And we went down to Laredo, Texas. From Laredo, Texas, we went to Salt Lake City, where they formed the, the, the B-17 group. And uh, so there you were introduced to your pilot and co-pilot and navigator and gunners and radio yeah. and 
then from there we went to Dyersburg, Tennessee, where we learned to fly the V-17 and bomb and gunnery practice and everything. Had you known much about the B-17 before you? No, we didn't. <laughs> and how did you like that B-17? Oh, we, we, we loved it. This might be a time to talk about that B-17 a little bit. I'm going to give you this pencil, and uh, I'm going to focus in on that uh, there. Um, now this is this is a B-17G, I think, because it has that chin turret yes. up in the front. Now, was that the kind? You, what did you have a G model? When yes. You, did you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the other one was a square tail. Uh huh. Uh, show me uh, like where you would have been, yeah, obviously up right there. there. The nose of the, the plane. Nose of the plane, yeah. And you had a crew of ten, I believe. Nine. Nine, did you? Yeah, okay. And uh, <coughs> you and the navigator, I believe, were up front, were you not? Right, yeah, yeah we sat underneath the pilot and the, and the co pilot. Right. There was a little room there. The navigator had a desk, and of course, I had the northern bomb site. And then we each had guns and uh, had our own uh, ammunition box. Right, yeah. And um, then the, the pilot, you can show us where the pilots would be. They've obviously been up there. And you got a top turret, and that would be what, the flight engineer? Or the, the engineer, crew chair, yes. He uh -huh. would handle that. Or, and his job was to be sure everything was running properly. He kept all the plane running right, and then time of necessity operated the guns. Right. Yeah. And I think about halfway back was where the radio uh, radio right. man was somewhere in but those. In here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe a little bit forward there. The radio That's engineer had, a, had all his equipment there. And we had a side gunner and a, on both sides. Right. And then the tail gunner. Yeah. And you had a ball turret guy there too. Oh, yeah, like. yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I understand it was a pretty, rather sturdy plane. It could take a lot of very, punishment. Very, very, Yeah. Okay, good. So um, you got your crew together. Um, and from I, I suppose you you to come to depend upon each other. You work as oh, a yes. team, right? Oh, yes. And oh, yeah. The co-pilot got married in Dyersburg, Tennessee. And, uh, to go over that. Right. <laughs> and uh, then we went to Kearney, Nebraska, uh, where we were issued our plane. And Kearney, Nebraska was only eight mile, 80 miles from my town of Humphrey, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. But I didn't get it, I couldn't go home. They wouldn't let you out. The plane you got, did, was it camouflaged like that one, or was it the silver plane? It was silver. I understand that early on, when the Germans were uh, bombing England, they, they camouflaged them like that. You're right. But that the drag of the paint slowed the plane down a little bit, so the, the, the non were faster. And so yeah. They didn't need to camouflage them, I guess, after a while. So. That's right. <laughs> and uh, so, did you fly your plane? Guys, fly the, your plane over to England? Oh yeah, we flew. We we got called about. Two o'clock in the morning, to, we left. Uh, planes left about five minutes behind each other, and we went from there to Boston, up to Goose Bay, and to Iceland. And we got weathered in there for three days. It was real. It was something to see to see the GIs out playing baseball at three o'clock in the morning. Oh yeah, because it does it. So this was kind of in the summertime then when you yeah. were going over. Yeah, yeah it was uh, daylight all night, all day long. This would have been the summer of '44 when you were going over. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's right. And then of course we went on to England and uh, turned in our plane there, and then we bust into the into our, our base. Which was uh, your Peter, base? Peterborough, England, which was about 80 miles from London. Okay. Not from London. Uh -huh. And uh, which bomb group were you with? The 340, uh, 51st Bomb Group, the 511th Bomb Squadron. And that's the 8th Air, Air Force. Force, right, yeah. Um, 
So, uh, how long were you there before you went on your first mission? Well, we did a lot of practicing there. We did a lot of flying. And uh, evidently they were short of navigators at the time. Or short of bombardiers. Uh, my first mission was with another crew. And uh, we went in and we bombed La Havre, France, which is right on the coast. Oh, man, this is duck soup. <laughs> we were in and out of there before you could see. <laughs> this is the yuck. Told my crew, nothing to worry about. <laughs> well, from then on, it was a lot dirt. <laughs> then we went into France and then England. Did you have fighter escort uh, all the way, uh, wherever you were going? Usually to? did. Uh, on the... Uh, on the on my 13th mission, which is my crew's fifth mission, oh, to show you how many more missions I we, uh, we were in, our, our target was Ruland, Germany, R-U-H-L-A-N-D, and uh, of course we hadn't got there yet, we were, you could see Berlin off to the right, and uh, in fact, going in, we flew over my future home, North Germany. <laughs> and, uh, so the fighter escorts went on ahead, and right behind them came the Messerschmitts 109. And this, they would dive on one group and pull up on another, and just went right. We lost nine planes that day out of our group alone, of 46 planes, and each one nine people. And uh, of course, we were hit, uh, set a fire, and so we were. We got the orders from the pilot to abandon ship. My biggest problem: you didn't wear your parachute; you just wore a harness. And I always kept my parachute right here, my right hand, on top of my uh, ammunition box. And uh, man, I reached over to get no parachute. <laughs> well, the navigator ran out of ammunition, got in the way, and his, my parachute was buried. And I, of course, I'd already taken off my gas mask, so I knew I didn't have much time to fool around. If I, you know, get like some gas, gas mask. <laughs> and uh, so I finally found it, and uh, there was a big box in my way. I kicked it out the door, and uh, I looked up, and the pilot was still there, and I told him, he'd better get his fanny out of there, and I jumped. You went out the... The bottom The bottom the hatch. The, the hatch, yeah. That's how you got in all the time. I see in the movies, yeah, you grab, grab that and you swing your feet up. In that's it. right. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, it was, that was the main entrance right to our where we were right. working. Yeah. And uh, when I, you know, I figured we were flying around 28,000 feet, and I figured by the time I found everything and ready to go with it, it was probably around 20,000. So the plane's on fire. Is that uh, the engines are on, or an engines on fire, yes. or what was burning? Okay. Yes. Okay. Any any of the crew shot up at this time? Anybody no. get hurt? Just the, the plane's no. on fire. Everybody was gone but the pilot. And uh, so I saw some fleecy clouds way down below. I figured it'd be about five thousand feet from the ground, and I free fell to them. Which is quite an experience in itself. You stick your hand out and then it slips. <laughs> did you go out? Did you like feet first, or how did you? Feet uh, first, just, yeah. yeah. But then, uh, with the heavy uh, chest pack and everything, it made you lay on the back. Okay, and you had um, a pilot chute, I think, didn't you? Uh, so when you at like five thousand, you pulled that, and it opened, and then it pulled right. the rest of the. Right. And, and everything uh, open fine for you? Everything fine, yes. And 
fact, when the chute opened, I'm looking at her, here's the engineer off the plane about 300 feet away. <laughs> so when we landed, why, we, he came my way, I went his way, and we got together. Now, did you la land out in the countryside? or We were in kind of? a big grove of trees. And unfortunately for him, he got hung up in a tree and sprained his ankle. And uh, I went right into the ground. You made a good landing, didn't get, you made a good landing? Didn't yes. Mm -hmm. Rough, but good. Right. <laughs> yeah, so we stayed out uh, three days. We, it was kind of, you were 80 miles from Glen, you know, where, where in the hell, what are you going to do? <laughs> well, number one, the escape map we had didn't quite cover the area where we were. We were off our map, number one. You had a little, little, little case with hard foods, and the best thing was you had a sack, sack in there for water and pills to, make, to help make the water right, which was the biggest thing that we used. Of course, we ate the foods, too. My biggest worry after the next day was, damn, I left a Hershey bar up there. <laughs> now, were there little farms around this area? Oh, yes, exactly yes, what it was. Yes. Did you see people? Did yeah, you? yeah, you had to be very careful. So you, you were kind of hiding in the woods? We would, we would do a sleep during the daytime and then travel oh, at night. night. And we decided that our best route to go is go to Switzerland. Uh, we figured going to Russia, we didn't know what get to the Russian lines would be, and we knew damn well you couldn't go to the American line. You have to go to the German. Uh, yeah. So we walked did a lot of walking. We had a lot of sugar beets. <laughs> I uh, I went down to the farmyard one one day and. Captured goose. <laughs> that doubled his neck back so it couldn't squawk or anything and beat it back up. <laughs> and uh, we tore off its legs and feathers and started cooking it. And about that time, a farmer hollers at us uh, put out the fire. So I stopped our meal. <laughs> So we're back to sugar beets. Did you could you speak German? No. Did your I mom could understand it a bit. Did your parents at home did they speak? My grandmother and bad? uncle spoke German, so I I could understand it. And I knew what was going on. <laughs> you knew what he was saying. <laughs> yeah. When, uh, so we spent three days like that. It was, like we, we would, it was cold. It was in September. First thing we had to do is get rid of our electric suits because we had no place to plug them in anyway, and they were bright blue. <laughs> they weren't the thing to oh. wear. <laughs> yeah. So we got rid of those, and of course we had no no protection against the cold at all. So we were cold, and we get in the haystacks and we get warm, and <laughs> and then unfortunately. We picked a haystack this one morning that the farmer decided they were going to liberate. And we crawled out of there and started running, but he had rifles and there were several others around. They had pitchforks, and so that was the end of our what we, <laughs> we sat in the farmyard from, I'd say, about, we didn't sit, we stood from about 8 in the morning until 5 or 6 at night. And I could tell the, the biggest portion, there were about 20 or 30 people around. And the biggest portion to uh, get rid of us right away. Fortunately for us, the mayor of the town kept preaching to them what the army would do if they turned us in, all the benefits they would get. So. Uh, Finally, he went out. 
So we we sat we brought up a little one horse go kart, two wheeled go kart. And the engineer and I sat with our feet dangling out the back and the, the guy that captured us had a rifle on our backs. <laughs> and we rode into a loop to our station that way. By the way, we they didn't give us anything to eat all day either. Uh, there were some Prussian, Australian forced worker kids that were probably around 12 years old. And they would sneak a sweet bits every time. We so we were pretty hungry. <laughs> we got to the Luftwaffe station and we thought, well, we'll get something to eat. All they gave us was a piece of hard, dark bread to eat. And, you know, it was real, real amusing. We, well, it wasn't amusing. <laughs> it was hectic. <laughs> the first thing is you had the clanking of the doors. And, but uh, well, a couple hours later, each of us with a guard got on a train right with all, all the people. Nobody paid us any attention. We rode into Berlin and came on an elevator. And you could see the fires all over Berlin. There were, there were well, lots of them. And uh, then we got into the railway station there and transferred to a bus, and we were in a double-decker bus. Had they interrogated you before? Uh, no, not, not yet. Not, yet. Okay. Not, not other than the farmer group okay. wanted to... This was kind of amusing. They, like, they wanted to, get, to show the Army that they had done a good job. They had their good friend young gal that taught their kids English come up and talk to us to try and find out where we were from and everything. I not understand you. <laughs> and she spoke in English. <laughs> so that didn't go too well for her. <laughs> anyway, then we got on a double deck box and went to Tumble Off Air Girl. And uh, where we met a lot more Americans, none, none that we knew. But then the ungrateful English that night bombed the family. <laughs> unfortunately, or fortunately, we didn't get hurt. We, we survived. And I talked to fellows like you, and they say undergoing a bombing like that is the worst thing that they right. A lot worse than being up in the sky when you're down there at the bottom. Right, you think, that's right. You could, you, could, said you could almost understand those people being so mad, upset, you know, when right. they're being bombed all the time. Oh, yeah, because like there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, and, and if they get a hold of somebody that's dropping those bombs, you're not going to be very yeah. nice to them, probably. Kill, kill, kill the kid or two of theirs and their wife or somebody or their close friends. They're not going to have much mercy. So your worst worry was the civilians. The army were far enough along in the war. The army personnel knew what was going to happen to them if they were <laughs> So anyway, then we went from there to Uberoso as we were leaving on the truck. I was at the end of the tail of the truck. And I'm uh, looking out and seeing all these fires are burning, and I lost control of myself and let a big smile get on my face. And all of a sudden, wham, across my ear. And uh, the garden and the preaching in the bed. But anyway, we went to Oberusel and uh, where they interrogated us and spent two days there. But what, what, was the, what was what did they ask you? What was the interrogation like when you went? <clears throat> well, they were trying to find out what the source you mentioned was. Of course, the first thing was where your home was in uh, America, where you were from, where your parents' name and everything. Of course, all I got was your, your serial number, and that was it. Uh -huh. 
so were they did they were they like harsh with you or just kind of they were, there were several of them that were pretty harsh yes but again as I say we're towards the end of the war uh, they had to be careful too <laughs> the uh, guys that you know like you that I've interviewed say that they probably knew more than you did about the things they're asking you, you know. Yeah, yeah. About your men, they probably knew how many planes, how many went down, how many this or that, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because a little later we found out there were nine planes of our 45 that went down that day. And nine people of one each one, so there were a lot of Americans rolling around. And that was right. only of our group. And we, when we left England that morning, there were 1,800. B-17s and B-24s. Like I wrote in my history there, I swear you could get out and walk in the France. <laughs> anyway, it it's, it's it always seems amazing too, the, because uh, there's probably, in England, the weather wasn't that good, there's a lot of overcast, and right. getting that many planes with as few accidents as they had, to me, it's just, uh, I can't, oh, it's it unbelievable. Was scary. You, get, you take off in the morning, and before you were anywhere, you were in the fog. And you knew there was a plane right behind you with a load of the bombs, and another right in front of you with a load of <laughs> Usually you had to go to at least ten to 12,000 feet before you... And I tell you, everybody in that plane was cramming to see where that one in front and the one behind. And of course then you... You had to get attached to your group, and they, they set off flares. Uh, we knew what color flare we had to get, and we joined the, that flare group. And uh, that's how we started our missions in. Were you pretty religious in those days? Very much so. In fact, I... I... Uh, yeah, that is the reason for my coming through every... For instance, when I opened my parachute, I could have just been, been turned 180 degrees the other way and not even seen the other guy. I had going that way, whether he saw me or not. So, oh yes, every... It was, I was the only Catholic on our nine... nine uh, people that were in the plane that were Catholic. And uh, the chaplain at the air base would come out every morning, regardless. And I had communion every morning at the flu. So yeah, I was, I, I felt that he had to be close to him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like they say, not too many atheists in foxholes and probably not too many uh, right, when you're right. getting shot at. <laughs> Even in prison camp, there was a priest. Yeah, in prison camp, we had a British, uh, all right, he was from Ireland, he was a redhead Irish. And uh, why, why he was a prisoner, I don't know, but he was, he would come around to our compound. And then another thing, out of 18 people in our, uh, in our barracks, I was the only Catholic, or no, there were two of us Catholic. So we would take a bench down and we have to go down to another dormitory and sit in their hallway and that's where we had mass. But anyway, then we went to Wetzlar and that's where we were assigned what camp we would go. And then from there to Barth, Germany. So that's where Stalag Luft 1 was? Stalag Luft 1 is Barth, Germany. And what part of Germany is that in? Okay, it was but about 80 miles from Berlin, right on the coast, you could look out and see uh, uh, Switzerland mm -hmm. on a clear day. But uh, we were about two miles out of town. And, uh, what, were the guards, were they older guys, or what, what, what were they like? Well, it was kind of amusing. Uh, when we got there, they were around 50 years old. They begin to get older. The, the younger ones had to go to war. <laughs> How did they treat you? 
very, very good. You had no complaint. Uh, they wouldn't give you any truth, whatever. <laughs> you, knew, you knew by listening to them they were winning the war. <laughs> <laughs> did you have, um, did you know what was going on the outside? Did you have little radios or anything? No. And, and you had no idea how the war no. was going or any information? No, some of the, there were, uh, this is a big camp. Uh, I was in the fifth compound, and there were thir 13,000 people in a compound. And uh, after I was there, what was it, about five months, they started the sixth compound. So it shows you how many people. And this is just one camp uh, all over Germany. It's just loaded. And this all uh, air, air air force type. This was all air. Both it was all. originally a British camp. A British, many of the British were there for five years. Yeah. A long time. Mm -hmm. um, did you come across any of your crew crew members? Yes, we all got together. In fact, so they were all, all the same? of the, our four officers were all in the same barracks. Oh, okay. in the same room. Yeah. <laughs> And the structure of the camp, that, did they have some by that kind of ran things, you know, kind of the, the structure of uh, s s who's in charge of the <coughs> barracks and things, you had kind of a command uh, oh, yes. situation? Oh, yeah, yes. Our, uh, our American forces uh, made sure you, you kept a clean camp that you... Uh, and, and were the British in a separate <coughs> area, or did you mingle well, with the British? Well, they were all in the... More or less in the first compound. We had no British in our compound whatsoever. Uh, what was the food like? <laughs> it's like what you made it. If you got a Red Cross parcel, which was all about a foot square, if you got that once a week, you could eat fairly well. Each man got his parcel. But we'd get one. Once, twice, three times, maybe even five every fifth week. So that becomes first. Then every now and they would dump a load of potatoes on the ground out there, and a load of cabbage, uh, and every now and then bring a vat of uh, horse meat. Did you lose a lot of weight? I was about 170, 175 pounds when I went in, and came up to 120. Um, did you ever get sick or bad? Unfortunately, no. no I, uh, we were a little limited to what we could have there. Yeah. Um, did you, what did you did you what did you do for entertainment or whatever? Well, uh, the Red Cross. Thank good to the Red Cross. They gave us a lot of uh, ball equipment. Uh, Basketball, such as that. So during the good months, when the snow was on the ground, away, they also gave us some books. Not many. It's very, very hard to go around. Yeah. Um, um, any? Did anybody try and break out of? Camp, no. You know of. Yeah. Uh, all of our uh, dormitories, or our rooms, were three foot off the ground. In other words, they could they they turn dogs loose in there at night. And in the daytime, you were surrounded by uh, guard stations. You had uh, two layers of uh, barbed wire went up about 20 feet and about oh, four feet apart and, uh, and tangled barbed wire in there and then they had the guard station go up about 20 feet on each corner in the middle and then they had a single wire going around 20 feet before you got to the fence and you were told you don't go in there. Did you know any Jewish prisoners? 
No, don't think so. Was, uh, I ha I was curious about how they if they treated them any differently. Uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think stuff. they did because I've interviewed uh, at least one fellow who was Jewish and they Those knew he was and he said they never. No uh, problem. Never yeah. uh, uh, did you have contact with your parents or did they know what had happened to you or anything? Well, it took them about three or four months to find out. But all they knew is they got their mail back. <laughs> And uh, so uh, finally they were made aware that uh, I was a prisoner. Uh, and were, did you ever be able to write back and forth to them? We had, uh, I forget what they called it, a little, pe a little paperwork that you had to, uh, and you had to be careful what you said because it all got blacked out. <laughs> yeah. And the parents had to be careful what they said because you weren't going to read what you weren't supposed to. Now I understand a lot of the camps, when the Russians were starting to come about in January, they started marching. Did that happen to you? No. Oh, okay. We were fortunate that we did. Okay. Now, when the, the war in uh, April and May of, of uh, 44, 45, you could hear guns at night in the Russians. The Russians were coming. We painted POWs on our barracks. And the Germans tried to get in. They were scared. The people, the civilians. They oh. didn't dare leave me because you didn't know what the, what the Russians were going to do to us. We're sitting there, uh, dead ducks. Uh, we were allowed to dig trenches, and uh, which we did. And uh, finally, on the, I think on May the second, the Russians came in. Did you ever see any of our aircraft go over? Or oh neighbor? yeah, just like we evidently did when uh, when I got shot down, we flew right over the camp several times. Some planes would fly over. <laughs> You're out there cheering, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, everybody was cheering. But uh, when the Russians came in, I, it was funny. They were mostly afoot, men and women, and uh, many of them were very gruff. And the first thing they did is they herded a bunch of cattle all the way from Russia into our camp. Well, we knew down the hill they came right there from Germany. <laughs> anyway, we started eating. And of course, when we found the warehouse, it was loaded with Red Cross bars. And it held back. Yeah. So we had a lot, and then we got all our memorabilia out of their offices and everything. Did the Russians any of them speak English? Some of them did. I didn't speak to any of them. We, uh, we were told to stay away from them. And of course, our commanding officers uh, spoke with them. Yeah. And uh, hopefully, we would get out the next time. Uh, I think it was around the 13th or 15th before they finished. <laughs> To go to Europe, to the American lines, you mean? Yeah. Oh, okay. Now, some people uh, took off, left. Our guards, tried to, tried to get our guards had all left, except yeah. oh, one or a few stayed there. But most, most guards were gone. And uh, they didn't want to meet with the Russians either. <laughs> so, uh, Many, uh, quite a few people that uh, there was a Texan out of our room that left. And this fellow that we met from Dana Point, he, he uh, hiked out. But I decided that uh, that wasn't for me. We stayed around there, and then we did around the middle of the month, and we were finally taken into. Camp Lucky Strike in France. 
Let's pause here. I think I'm going to change my tape here. Doing okay? Yeah. Okay? We're doing great, yeah. Um, why don't you share with us what we just, what you, what we were just talking about here? Um, I, I said I'd like to see your little poem in memoriam. Uh, and I could read it from back here, unless you'd rather read it. Okay, and when did when did he write this? That was in that notebook. Oh, oh, uh, well, Angela, we need I'll to. I'll show you the. Okay, before you do that, let's let's. But let's, it's 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 so tiny. No, no, I know that. I, I, but I want to. Yeah. Let's get a little. Okay. Okay. Where I put this up? Okay, I've got something here. Now tell me what this is. No, well, that was uh, my notepad that I made in uh, prison camp. How did you how did you make it? That's out of. Uh, what we what were clim cans, powdered milk cans, which was the same, about the size of a, uh, a pound coffee can get. And uh, that's all we had to think. Oh, <laughs> huh. that's really clever. Yeah. So you made a little, uh, like a little um, screw yeah. or something like that that it folds up. And that's great. And then this was your. Now you weren't were you allowed to keep a diary or anything? I mean, if they well, knew you had done this, they wouldn't have cared for it so much. Determined if, really. if they knew you were doing it, they wouldn't have approved of it. No. Right. Yeah. Huh. Okay. But that, as you see, is the best thing we had to write on is our cigarette papers. Oh, that's what this says. Uh huh. <laughs> so tar you got to hear the target of the day was Ruland. Shot down September 12, 1944. Picked up September 15th, 44. Got to Berlin then. And he said, you got a typhoid booster. <laughs> <laughs> the Air Force, three, three, okay. Signed to the 8th Air Force, 351st Bomb Group, 511th Bomb Squadron, Peterborough. Yeah, there's your camel. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was the back of cigarette packs. I'll be done. All of them camels? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. They were all things. Okay. And then this is the in memoriam. That's, so you wrote that. That's kind of neat. Uh, in prison camp. Yeah, I know, but I mean, do you remember exactly when it was, when you first got there or mm -hmm. later? Or? No. I don't imagine when I first got there, when I first got there, I was literally what you wanted to do. Yeah. Okay, why don't you go ahead and read it now, I'll keep it up here, yeah. If in mortals there be love, this is not, that they shall live and fight or die together. In truth it should be said, airmen do not die, for in the hearts of those who wear the silver wings upon their humble breasts and invade the crystalline blue with wings of steel, we still fly in close formation with those who fly on angels' wings. Oh, that's, that is really special. Hmm. Had you, uh, this you call that the flea trap, is that kind of what your, what your, uh... The flea trap, that was over, so that was where you interrogated you. Oh, where you were interrogated. <coughs> and it was, it, they was loaded with little mites. <laughs> And the hot box was? Okay, see this oven? We made the oven of the same Oh, you yeah. did? Oh, okay. In camp you made that, huh? Yeah. Oh, okay. We had an oven there. We... Yeah. <laughs> of course, most of our eating was soups. That there was for eating. You could, you could heat a soup up fast. Oh, okay. <laughs> our main... Our main utility for cooking was a two-gallon pail. <laughs> and your home sweet home shows the beds and tables and all that stuff. Right. <laughs> Eight, 18 of us were in a, in a, in a room. Uh -huh. And you, you lived, uh, you, you did your own cooking. You, that was it. <laughs> And these are the different uh, units, or different blocks, I guess, or different 
Well, that was out of, in, in, in our own compound. There were about 10 or 12 uh, barracks. Then you had two outside latrines. Okay, and this is a Stamlager lift one. Stamlager lift one. What does that mean, Stamlager? The North Camp for somewhere I can't, uh -huh. can't remember what that's but. <laughs> and you've got a recipe for ersat spread. Yeah. <laughs> so you got? Did you make that? You would make, or they did it. They did German. That the German bread. Potato flour, rye, and sawdust. Sawdust. <laughs> Had to season it for three days before it was edible. <laughs> And these are, I guess, your diaries. Right. That is really. Christmas Day, 44. This is your. Well, we made up very appetizing menus. <laughs> Did you get to eat that? Or that was just a menu you made? That was just the menu. That's what you would have liked to have had. <laughs> oh, man. Well, that's that is really special. That's really something. Yeah, I was I was one of the prime cooks. <laughs> I was one of the soup makers. <laughs> but this poem, um, did you like to write poetry? Had you done much of that? Uh, oh, not too much. But it was just something that I would think about. Yeah. And, uh, how do we get guys together? You know, one of the amazing things was a sh shower. You got a shower about once every month and a half for a month. When you went for a shower, 20 of you went together. You went into a big room. They had about 20 shower heads. They turned the water on for half an hour, or <laughs> half an hour, half a minute oh. <laughs> <laughs> to get wet. Yeah. Then you'd soap up with the water off, and you get all soaked up, and uh, then they would turn the water back on for uh, maybe two minutes to get the soap off. Uh, and, and 20 of you all in that room together. Anyway, that was... Yeah. So how, you uh, did you walk to our lines, to the American lines, then from the prison oh, no, camp? We, did uh, they did they come in and pick you up or what? Uh, they came in and picked us up. They, we flew, over. and the amazing thing we we flew low over the Ruhr Valley, and it was demolished and because the Ruhr Valley was all Germans' industrial area. It was completely. And we, I don't know where we landed, but then we got, they put us on a train and uh, trained us into the Camp Lucky Strike. But we, we were held in a, in a compound for quite a while. And some of the fellows on the train found out that that tank car next to us was a wine car. <laughs> And the wine was just running down the street. <laughs> I didn't get any wine. I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't too enthused about getting wine at that time. But then Camp Lucky Strike, we spent uh, must have been there about a month. And the main thing there was to try and get you some weight on. My first day there was a bad old oh man. I had a tooth pulled, a molar, and they broke it. <laughs> so I spent quite a bit of time of the day there with that. But the unpleasant part of Camp Lucky Strike was they had German prisoners waiting on us. And <laughs> Which we didn't appreciate too much. <laughs> so 
So how did you get back to the States? Well, <clears throat> that was, uh, I got on one of these little Liberty ships that uh, Kaiser and his friends were making back in those days. And uh, I think there were about 50, 50 55 of us. So we, we had a very pleasant ride. It was slow, but uh, we had the run of the ship. We could do whatever we wanted. PX was free ahead of me. We didn't see anybody for a while. Was your crew uh, with you this time? Yes. You guys all were coming back together yeah. as a crew? Yeah. And the amazing thing, when we got to, into New York, and then we sat out waiting to come in. We were right behind the Queen Mary. <laughs> and the Queen Mary went in, of course, it had fireworks over <laughs> Shot water up in the air. <laughs> of course, we were the nobodies. Nobody knew what we were. That's funny. It's just a guy I just just interviewed Monday. He went over on the Queen Elizabeth and came back on the Queen Mary. So he had two real nice yeah. rides. Oh, they were stacked in there. They little round. You could probably see two heads coming out of. Them. And then we we. Uh, Park right behind it. Do you remember your thoughts when you first saw the Statue of Liberty coming oh, in? Oh yeah. Well, going back to when the Russians first took our camp that night, they played the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> so it, yeah, you got a lot of things. You knew you missed a lot. So when was this that you got back into New York then? Well, or what month? It must have been in July, probably. And then, of course, we were on the train and back to Nebraska. And, uh, I, I stopped in Kansas City. You went to Chevrolet, and, and then I went home. And then we had two months uh, vacation. Of course, she really is wanting me to come back then. <laughs> they had held your job for you. Then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we got home and, yeah, it was nice. <laughs> so uh, d when did you get out of the uh, service then? Oh, just when, uh, it must have been September sometime. They were insisting that I join the reserve. Yeah. I had enough. <laughs> so I wasn't about to do that. So they, they were at Kelly Field and they sent me up to Amarillo and I stayed in Amarillo about two months. So finally they gave me my release. So did you go back with Chevrolet then right away? Went back with Chevrolet, yes. How long did you stay with them? Well, <clears throat> I already decided I wasn't much of an accountant. I didn't like that job. And I wanted to get into sales. Or the upstairs of the, of the plant, there, half of it was the sales department, the other half was the accounting. So I made all my friends over in the sales department. So I'd get myself a job as a Parts representative, nothing happened. I get a job as a service representative, nothing happened. Finally, the controller called me in and says, "Now, this you're in accounting, and that's where you're going to stay." <laughs> so I said, "Well, fine." So I go back to my friends over in the sales department, and they found me a job office manager for a Chevrolet dealer. So that's when I left Chevrolet. Okay. And was that in Kansas City? That, no, it was a little town of Iola, Kansas. And uh, he was uh, he was an older man and he made a lot of money in the war tires and things. <laughs> he knew his way around. And uh, finally, I'd read in the paper where Big Blurred Vision was looking for people, and I applied.
applied and got a job there, first as an office manager for about two or three weeks, then as a district manager for southern, uh, uh, southern eastern Kansas and southwestern Missouri. What town was that? Well, it still is still. in Kansas City. Oh, okay. I traveled and I had 30, 30 dealers that I serviced. Okay. So uh, I worked there then and, and, and uh, then Buick opened up an office in Denver, Colorado. And I, I was transferred there as business manager. So as a business manager out of Denver, I, I, I traveled a lot. Of it. We had Wyoming, Colorado, Utah. Panhandle, Nebraska, a lot of Nevada, so I did a lot of traveling. <laughs> and they, and several, two or three years later, they closed the Denver's office and transferred me to San Francisco. But that's how I oh. became a California. <laughs> when so? When did you end up in San Francisco? <coughs> oh, I don't remember what year. It was. Early fifties, sometime or yeah. like sometime on there. And what was your capacity? As business manager there, and traveled to all of California and uh, Oregon and in Nevada again. And, uh, I guess that was. And then uh, the same thing happened to me there. I, I felt I should be advanced, and no advancement, so. Left and went to work for as general manager of the Buick dealer in Fresno, California, and that was a bad move too. He was there was no way you could he was losing money. And he, there was no you could, way you could straighten him out because he wouldn't do it. <laughs> for instance, I would uh, I insisted I had approval uh, sales contracts. And uh, so I would turn them down, turn one down, and first thing I'd see, the guy's driving a car. Well, they put in a lease program. So now the man that can't afford to buy a car, they gave him a, a lease car. <laughs> so I would drive around at night with keys in my pocket, picking up cars. <laughs> and finally, this became impossible. At, at that time, the zone manager out of Denver uh, left, left Denver, left, left GM, and joined a, an insurance man from uh, Los Angeles and developed a program for insuring automobile dealers. And so he and his partner were keeping insisting that I insured by I don't know damn thing <laughs> so anyway I finally did it which turned out to be the very very good thing I, I traveled up and down selling and calling on all the dealers and this is a big package you've got to insure all those cars all, the, all their liability exposures all their work comp so it's a big package So I did that for several years, three or four years. And 30? 30. <laughs> I was supposed to retire. And we bought a home down in uh, San Clemente, in what they call the, uh, what was it? The Shark Lips. The Shark Lips area. So I, I wanted a home near the water or a pie where you could see good. Well, unfortunately, I didn't retire. <laughs> and with Proposition 13, and uh, the rollover from selling my house in, in, uh, California, in uh, Los Angeles, I couldn't move into that house. <laughs> so we had to buy another house, <laughs> which we still have, both of them now. 
Mm-hmm. Did you uh, did you uh, do any boating or anything when you were living down no. that area? I know you told me that you played tennis. Uh, when did you start playing tennis? And get... Oh, I started playing tennis in uh, in uh, Kent City, Missouri. This uh, zone manager in Denver was the assistant zone manager in Kansas City. Then he and his family uh, were quite the tennis folks, so I joined them and, and played tennis with them a lot. And then when we went to Denver, played there. Well, <clears throat> with work and everything else, it kind of died out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And uh, when did you meet Harriet? Um, I'll let you guys uh, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, Harriet, why don't, you, why don't you go over and have a seat here <coughs> by this young man? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, in selling insurance to automobile dealers, she happened to be going with this one gentleman. And, so I got acquainted with him. We'd go out at night. And uh, evidently things didn't work right there. So I had asked her one time on the phone, you know, how about going out sometime? And she said, fine, okay. Well, if she puts it, it was about eight or nine months. <laughs> Three months, but. In the meantime, my father had died, and, uh, and so I had problems too. <laughs> what he's not telling you is that his friend, I was dating his friend, and became acquainted, and because of, of an accident that wasn't my <laughs> fault, I had um, I was insuring her car. <laughs> yeah, I, basically, my friend introduced me to Mel and says, he'll, he'll sell you insurance, and Mel did not like individual policies at all. He, he wanted just the big business, but um, that's that's how we met. And then later there was another accident that the, the farm, uh, and because I was with his company, uh, they said they were not going to pay off on it because uh, a motorcycle had hit the front end of my car. And they said, no, this wasn't your fault. We won't pay off. And I had gotten a notice saying, how did you like our service we paid for this accident? So I started inquiring with the uh, adjuster and found out um, that there was another accident on the same day with the same last name, and that's how they filed their claims. And it was a direct back in. So I, I called Mel, and he says, oh, yeah, he says, um, in the meantime, farmers had put me in their high-rated company. And he called me and said, why did they do that? And I told him, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, it wasn't your fault, you know. <laughs> and uh, so then I got him to talk to the adjuster. And so there were conversations going. And he says, uh, what happened to you and my friend? And I said, well, we haven't been seeing each other for quite some time. And then th- this went back and forth. And he finally said, you know, would I be out of line to ask you to go out? And that's how it started. <laughs> and? Well, we're married now. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. So, <laughs> Quite happily, I can tell. Yes, right. He's a great guy. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I think about five years ago, things went bad from bad to worse. Physically, he started Physical. to deteriorate. Oh. I had a heart problem, and what they have, they, uh, they gave me this easy deal where you oh. just take an aspirin a day, and that was fine. We made it, went on a vacation out to the East Coast, and we were traveling the Civil War areas, mm-hmm. and having a good time, all of a sudden I began to get tired. Cleared out. So we got back home with the doctor. Well, they had to give me another. But uh, they were going to do another angioplasty, angioplasty. and Plasty. decided that they would do a triple bypass the next day. It was 
and laying on the table waiting for them to do this process and they won't be back up and so they couldn't, it was too close to my heart. Mm -hmm. So I had a triple bypass. And then from there, we got involved with the, just losing all the way. Since it's always. Well, and then, then about a year later, he started having mini strokes, the TIAs. And uh, somewhere along the way, there was an actual stroke. But he had some paralysis and some speech slurring at first. And as you can see, nice. he has. Uh, come through that, and that was uh, three years ago. And he's um, he's not as healthy as he'd like to be. He's not as full of vim and vigor like he'd like to be. can't drive a car anymore. And, but I think he does remarkably well. I think the, the Lord's taking pretty good care of you, I think. Right. The Lord's you've been through, yeah. Um, yeah, I have a friend who, I think it was the same kind of thing. They, Sometimes they can just put a little stent in, they did that. and it was too close to his heart or something to be able. So he had, they had to have the triple bypass too, and it worked out fine. Uh, so, Harriet, where did you grow up? I grew up in Ohio. Where? In central part of Ohio, Newark, which is 35 miles east of Columbus. And my family, most of my family, is still there. My uh, sisters. Black eyes. Huh? Did you go to uh, Ohio State? Or? No, I um, I got married quite young and uh, had four children, five actually, and one died uh, with a congenital uh, heart problem. <coughs> and we came to California in um, 1950. That's how we came to California, and then the Los eventually, LA or? Um, in, in, right in in a century in Vermont and Los Angeles at first, and uh, it was a different world then. And okay. then uh, I eventually went to work for Aerospace Corporation and the telephone company, and uh, retired from the telephone company in 1987. Time um, there was a divorce, and uh, then my ex husband died. And I met Mel, and <laughs> here lived, we are. Lived happily ever after. Um, children? Do you have? I have uh, four children. And what are their names? Uh, Mike, he's um, in New Jersey. And Don, who works for Hughes, um, well, it was Hughes, it's Raytheon now. And he, at um, middle age, is um, working on his master's degree. And then Mark, who is a carpenter like his dad and his grandfather. And Mary, who is an accountant. Um, and then we have Amy, which is Mel's daughter. And she has two small children. One two years old, and one was born December 28th. Oh. <laughs> and where does Amy live? In uh, Los Angeles. And any other grandchildren? Yeah. Um, my son Mike has um, a daughter, and Mark has uh, two stepsons, and they each have one child. And what do you guys like to do for recreation or for fun? Well, right now, trying to find something for recreation is kind of difficult. Well, we, yeah. we read but a lot. Yeah, that's and, right. And you like to read yeah, we, uh, like before, um, before his health problems, we would go out dancing, and we tried to find big bands. Oh, yeah. And uh, when we found that, we, we followed George Patton for a while when he would uh, have his uh, dances at the Palladium. Mm -hmm. and that was fun. Well, it was nice down there at San Clemente. We went to, uh, where we go dancing? The con oh, concerts under the stars at the mission mm. at San Juan Capistrano. Oh, yeah. They would have bands come in. We, we would go and they had a small uh, dance 
dance floor out in the uh, patio area. And uh, we take either, we would take a bottle of wine and cheese or something, and then local restaurants sometimes you can buy a expensive meal you can or, buy your dinner or, or people take, take dinner picnics oh, yeah. um, uh -huh. and we've taken the family uh, a couple times and, uh, and taken a picnic. And what parish do you belong to? What church do you go to? In, in uh, Our Lady of Fatima in San Clemente. It's, uh, they're talking about building a new church. <laughs> <laughs> well, San Clemente is growing tremendously. They're building 5,000 houses um, back in the hills, and so uh, they need another, uh, a larger or another church. Well, I sure appreciate you guys coming up today. Anything other else that you can think of you'd like to share? I might mention one thing. My sister's husband Jack Harwood worked for Hughes Aircraft. And in fact, he knew Hughes for a long time. He worked for him uh, with uh, TWA in Kansas City, Missouri. But when he was with him in, in uh, Los Angeles, when he flew the big flying boat that took off for about right. 30 seconds. Yeah, the Spruce Goose. The Spruce Goose. Uh, when Hughes got out to the plane to take off, he says, well, where's our radio engineer? Well, we don't have one. Well, get a radio engineer. Call Jack Harwood. Uh, so uh, he was on the Spruce Goose. The Spruce Goose. My wife's uncle, who I, I mentioned, just is turning 95. He uh, went to Escanaba, Michigan to get the Spruce for the Spruce Goose. So he worked, what they probably worked with uh, the, uh, uh, at the same time uh, there for, uh, for Hughes. <laughs> a small world. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. Well, folks, thanks again. Sure Thank you. It. Thank okay. you very much. All right. <laughs> Good. I'll shut it down.